Great. So I hope you can see the screen on your uh, screens. I've shared my screen. This is the first lecture or the first session for OET writing, right? We're going to do today is to know in order to understand how to write a letter that is required by the OET examiners for you to have feedback. All right, so I hope my voice is clear. If you guys have any questions at any point, you can always ask. And now we're just going to start because I have um, asked that it's going to be started at nine and it's already nine ten at my place. My voice is breaking. Is this the same with everybody else? Is it breaking right now as well? Is it okay now? Can everybody hear me now? If it's clear, I'll begin. All right. OK, that's great. So what we're going to do right now is first we're going to start with the writing criteria, writing assessment criteria along. That page, right? And this is. Writing. All right, so there are seven writing criteria for OET writing. And there are six writing criteria that you need to understand. The first one, right? The first one right here is purpose. OK, what did I do? Right, so the first one here is purpose, right? The second one is content. The third one is conciseness and clarity, genre and style, organization and layout a lot of such, all right so these are the six criteria of oet writing that you need to understand now when you would be doing your letters what would it be for you is that you would be given a letter there will be a task given to you at the end of the letter i'm hoping that you all have um, or are familiar with what kind of pattern there is on your exam day for a letter for example you'd be given um a letter right so this is your can you all see the screen? We can see the screen, but your voice sometimes getting broken. It's getting broken still. Now it's better actually. All right. Okay. Maybe you should uh change your router or something because I think it's that it's Okay, so uh, I'm just going to you the first thing is that you need. Yeah, okay, so the first thing that you need to know is the purpose of your, your exam day. This would be like this, right? This is your letter. You would be having all the information here, the notes, and at the end of your letter, there'll be a task, right? It would tell you what you need to do in order to understand what the purpose of the letter is, right? So over here, you can see that, that what is purpose, right? Purpose means that what, what is the what are you right what are you supposed to do why are you writing the letter who are you writing the letter to the three questions that you need to revolve around when writing the letter are what who why right these are the three main questions that you need to understand or uh, uh, commemorate to your memory because this is what would be the basis for you whenever you're going to read the letter given to you you would be asking yourself questions like what was done to the patient what will uh, what was done to the patient what did i do to the patient what would the person that i'm sending the letter to what do to the patient right this is your what Okay, that's what the purpose defines, right? So what is the reason that you're sending the patient? What happened to the patient? What would be done to the patient? That is how you get to the purpose. Who, right? When it comes to OET letter writing, there are three who's, all right? I hope you jot this down somewhere. There are three who's that you need to get uh, clear of. The first one is you. You would either be a GP, right or you would be a practitioner right of any speciality now when you're been writing a letter there'll be two uh, two who's that you're supposed to uh, take care of the first one is your oet examiner right the second one is the doctor who is receiving the letter now when you would be writing the letter i know that there are certain terms for example there is that 
rheumatic mellitus, right? And we usually abbreviate it as DM, right? Now, the doctor would understand what DM is, but the OET examiner would not understand what DM is. So in order for you to make the things clear, you'd be taking care of these two who's. That whenever I'm going to write this, this makes clear of the abbreviations that you'd be using, that what kind of abbreviations can I use? For example, there's a psychiatrist. A psychiatrist would understand uh, the deep clinical terms like um, uh, visual, visual or auditory hallucinations or other certain terms, right? Like let them think in, et cetera, et cetera. But the OE examiner might not. So you have to be very clear of using the terminology as well, right? Then why, why is the main thing which defines the purpose of your letter writing? Is this clear to everybody? It's really important that you understand and jot down these three um, three questions to your memory. That is who, what, and why, right? So we're just going to read it now, the purpose. Now, the purpose of document is immediately apparent and sufficiently expended as required. Now, when you would be writing your letter, we'd be learning how to write the letter as well. So in that part, uh, you would be given an introduction. The introduction, so as soon as the person starts to read the letter, right they should know the purpose of your letter right so what they're seeing is that when you have read the letter do you want to why was this patient sent to you why are you sending the patient who you are sending the patient who what and why these three things throughout the letter when you're reading it you have to take care of and that de that defines the purpose of you writing the letter right it, it's immediately apparent so if you want to make something immediately apparent you'll be writing it in your introduction right in your introduction of the letter you have to make sure that you mention why you're sending the patient what you want the patient all right and apparent sufficiently expanded that means that as you go through in your letter you would be expanding uh, your introduction and what was with what what was done to the patient in the following paragraphs all right is this clear to everybody that they are judging you on the criteria of purpose and this is the only criteria where you have to, where you have three bands right so in other uh, criteria you have seven bands that is if you um, even come to this point right you might get a b but in criteria, in purpose, there is no concentration. You have to be very, very clear about writing your purpose. If you um, understood the purpose, right, the purpose of you writing the letter, then the rest of the letter, the letter writing becomes very, very clear. Is my voice clear? Is everybody following? I'm going to keep on saying it so that I'm, I'm sure that you all are following through. Everybody clear so far about what purpose means? Yeah. Okay, I think I should move forward. All right. Everybody clear on that? Yes, that's correct. Okay, now after purpose, right, there are, there are three, uh, uh, there are others five uh, criteria, but those criteria are dependent on you understanding the letter. The rest of the criteria would be meaningless because you wouldn't know what you have to choose in the content. Because you know, when you know what you are choosing in the content. So, for example, you write, right, and you're writing a letter to um, a psychologist, right? And please be very clear, this is an interactive session, so I would want you all to answer as well. So you're writing a letter to a psychiatrist and the person, the patient that you have is of depression, right? Your case is of depression. He has been, he has, and you are the GP. You're writing the letter as a GP. You're, right, you're sending this letter to a psychiatrist, right? Who are you? You are the GP. The purpose of your letter is not clear yet, but you do know that, that the person has depression. Now, you do all the information in your in your case notes right you will be given their, their past history present history how many times they came to you what drugs are they taking what is their what i'm saying is that you have a case of depressed person you are as a gp to a side has been coming to you and just last week He's a known case of asthma, and last week he had an asthmatic attack, 
Now it's clear. Sending this person to the psychiatrist for suicide. All right, this is your reason of sending the person to the psychiatrist. Depressed person. He has a history of asthma. And last week he has asthma. He had asthma, which has now been cleared out. My question to you: asthma in the letter that you write, would you be writing the fact that he came to you last week and you had treated him for asthma, or you would just put it in the personal in in the past history paragraph only, and you wouldn't mention his last episode to the psychiatrist that you're writing this letter to? Would you write it, or would you wouldn't? I would not. I would, would write, write it. Would write it. All right. Yeah. You would write it. All right. Some of you are saying you'd write some. All right. Now what I know more is right? having suicidal thoughts and we're sending him to a psychiatrist. Now uh, I told you that he had asthma last week and now I'm saying that this person also has diabetes mellitus and he is hypertensive. All right. And he has uh, a family history of depression. All right. And just last week when he was having asthma, uh, he he tried to commit. Now which of all the asthma, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, he was depressive, he committed suicide. What is most important? He was depressive and committed suicide. Committed suicide, right? He, and he had a fracture. Two months ago, would you write this or you wouldn't write that he had a fracture uh, three months ago? I did. You'd write it or you wouldn't. Is it relevant to the person that you're sending this letter to? Who are we sending this letter to? I think uh, because the patient is having some depression, now the patient having fracture, it could be related to that also. I mean, this is making her life some miserable condition. Mm -hmm. no, so no, no, can no. be well, related. I'm that if you are given a certain set of information where you are told that the person is depressive, he has asthma, he has hypertension, he has diabetes mellitus, and right now he just committed suicide last week. I'm asking a question that if I ask you to choose this information, right, we're talking about the selection of content, whether we choose it or not. No. Okay, so we're going to move then if my voice is breaking. How about now? Is it good now? Yeah, no. Yes, it is good. Sometimes it breaks. Sometimes it breaks. I have no idea why that happens. It usually never happens. All right. OK, so what I'm saying is I'm asking the question and that is, would I be writing? Would I be writing about the fracture that this guy has to the psychiatrist? Would I mention it to him even if it happened three months ago? Is it a yes or a no? No. No, right? It's not relevant to the person. Right, it's not relevant to this person. So this is why we would not say this to them, right? So this is why I told you that you have to keep on asking when you select the criteria, uh, when you select the content for your letter, that who am I writing this letter to? What am I writing this letter for? Why am I writing this letter? Now I'm asking you again for, with the same set of information that I have, I've told you that the person has depression, he committed suicide. This is one set of information. He has diabetes mellitus, hypertension. He has asthma. Now I'm asking you that how would you how would you order these things, right? This is very messy, so I'm just going to clear it up and I'm going to ask again, right? I'm saying that he has a diabetes mellitus, right? This person has diabetes mellitus. He has hypertension, right? He has a suicide. He has committed suicide last week, and he tried to commit suicide last week, right? and that he had a fracture. Now, how would you put it in order, right? What is the first thing that you think you should write in your letter about his diabetes mellitus, about his hypertension, about his suicide, about his fracture? The first thing. Suicide. Suicide, We right? can so go with chronology. Chronology, you're saying with chronology. So for example, so are you saying in ascending chronology or descending chronology? Um. What happened like what recently to what happened in the what past? That's recently? always okay, we stick so to that, saying, right? As doctors. Right, right, okay, okay. So I'm saying that he had an attack of suicide, or he tried to commit uh, commit suicide uh, two weeks ago, right? And he had an asthma attack one week ago. So what do you think you should be writing first? 
suicide yeah, first right. in this case because it's, it's directly right. related to his present yeah. complaint. So see, it doesn't matter on the chronology. What it depends on is that what is the case and who you're writing the letter to. Right? It's really, really important that you understand that. Right? That's how you select your content for your letter. When you understand what is the purpose of the letter, who you're writing the letter to, what you're writing the letter for, and why you're writing the letter. Now see over here, it says content Content is appropriate to the intended reader. Now your intended reader there was a psychiatrist and addresses what is needed to continue care. Right, what does this mean? This means that when you would be writing the letter, you would point out whatever the person had, you would not be including or uh, excluding any relevant information that is important for the person you are sending them to, right? For example, if I'm sending this person to a psychiatrist, I don't tell them that they had a history of depression, right? We think maybe it's not important, right? And we exclude that out, right? Then, then this is not, uh, this is not, this is semi-relevant information. But if I exclude out the uh, the thing that he had suicide, he had committed suicide a week ago, right? That is something important for this person, right? This is really important for the person to know. All right, okay. So it's really important that you write this bit of information and then and then and then you're supposed to write about the relevant things and also you're going to write the semi relevant things, but never ever write the irrelevant things here. The irrelevant thing was that the person had fracture, right? That was very irrelevant. But what was relevant here? The fact that he had committed suicide. That was very relevant. Now I'm asking that I told you that this person had a family history of uh, uh depression do you think that's relevant irrelevant or semi-relevant relevant now i'm saying that whenever you're going to select content it would be on three things right you're going to divide the content like this that either it's irrelevant it's semi-relevant or it is totally relevant right i'm sure you might have heard of irrelevant and relevant but there are some sets of information that are semi-relevant what do you think this is that this the person it is semi relevant, right? So what I mean is that you do not miss out information that is relevant. You should exclude the things which are irrelevant, but sometimes there is information that is neither irrelevant, neither it's relevant, it's semi relevant. So you need to write that if you have the word count. All right. Uh, one thing I forgot to tell you that I had to tell you in the beginning is that you are supposed to write your letter in 180 to 200 words. All right, we're going to talk about it later as well, right? Everything clear about the content. This is really, really important. What I recommend is that when you're writing your letter, I need you to I'm, I have I've sent it in all the groups, right? So I want you to print this out or maybe you want to copy it and just uh, write these the first grid. On your writing table, just paste it there and read it before you write the letter. After you write the letter, always get back to it because this would be the very thing that would define you getting marks in your exam. Is that clear? Any questions so far? We need to move because we are going to also learn how to write the letter as well. Right? Clear? Is this is this criterion clear? Crit content, how to select content. So you have to again yes. think of three things. Who, what and why? Right, this is what would define how you select the content. All right, okay, great. Everybody's following. That's awesome. Key information is included, no important details, missing content from case notes is accurately represented. It all right, really, really important that you understand all of this. Okay, very important. Okay, now moving forward, conciseness and clarity. Can anybody tell me what is conciseness? How, what do you mean by conciseness? When I say conciseness, what does it mean? Anyone at all? It means not using wordy sentences, trying to give a lot of information in as uh, short and clear way as possible. Brief and clear. All right, that's that's good. That's good. That's a very good answer. So, for example, I'm saying that there is a patient and um, he is a patient of heart failure. All right, so he has congestive cardiac failure. I'm going to call it as HF or CCF. That's what we use. Try not to use these, right? Because obviously the doctor would know what these terms mean. But since I told you that when you'd be writing the letter, you'd be thinking of two who's, the OET examiner and the doctor that you're writing the letter to. The OET examiner would not know what CCF is or HF is, but the doctor would know, 
right? So whenever you're writing, make sure that you don't write such abbreviations. You would only write those abbreviations which you think a layman would know. For example, ECG. A lot of laymen do understand what ECG is. They do understand what X-ray is, right? Okay, so this is what is kind of important. I gave you a side note on that. All right, so talking about conciseness, right? For example, I'm saying that there is a patient and they have heart failure or congestive cardiac failure, right? That's what the patient has. And they come up to you and they say that they are not able to sleep at night and they use many pillows at night. And, and, and it's written in your notes like this, that the patient presented today and they use many pillows and breathless. Okay. All right. This is what it means, right? Okay. How many words are these? You're not, not going to write end like this. You're always going to write end like this, right? Pardon for my writing. But that's that's what's written here, right? So they are using many pillows and breathless at night. Okay. Okay. So what is in what is another term for breathlessness in our medical terminology? S O B. What? S O B shortness of breath. Okay, you're never dyspnea. going to say SOB. Okay, dyspnea, right? That's clinical. Okay, now SOB is shortness of breath, right? Again, I told you that you are going to take care of this. these words. Shortness of breath is again three words. It's not one word. You're not going to call it as SOB, right? Because I told you that you're writing this letter for the OET examiner, even though you're writing to a doctor, but your doctor, the doctor who you're writing this to, they're not going to give you marks. The marks or your grade is dependent on the OET examiner. If the OET examiner does not understand this, they wouldn't give you marks, right? So either you write shortness of breath, or if you want to write, you can write breathlessness, but a clinical term for both of these things is dyspnea, right? This now. Now, because this person has this condition at night, I'm, I'm giving you some clinicals here, but it's very, very easy, right? And they're using many pillows. So it is paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, right? Is, is it so? Right? Or sopnea along with PND, right? Okay. These terms are sopnea, dyspnea, you can use. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. All right. You can use these. OK, so what I'm trying to say here is that instead of using so many words, you should use clinicals as well or words that make things shorter. For example, I'm saying that the person uh, sweats a lot, right? Or if I say that the person drinks a lot, right? What are the clinical terms for that? He drinks a lot. He eats a lot. Right, if I say they he eats a lot. All right. If I say he eats a lot or if I say that he drinks a lot, polyuria, polydyspia, right? He's alcoholic. You can say that, right? You can say he's alcoholic, hyperphagia. The, there are so many terms that you can use. What I'm trying to say here is that try to make sure that you decrease the word, right? When we'd be uh, in, the, in the future classes, when we'd be doing red letter writing online, I'll give you the notes and I'll want you to write them and then, then I'll tell you how to decrease the word count, right? And now I'm telling you that there are, for example, there are two people, right? Two people on the exam day, uh, candidate A, candidate B. Both of them understand the purpose of the letter. Both of them have selected the same content, right? They are three here, seven here, right? They have selected the same purpose. They understand the same purpose and then they have selected the same content, right? Now, when they wrote the letter, candidate A wrote around 200 words. Candidate B wrote around 350 words, the same purpose, the same content, but the words that candidate A used were around 200 and the words that candidate B used were around 350. Who do you think should get better marks, candidate A or candidate B? Who do you think should pass? K. Okay. A, right? Why is that? Because he was clearly under the criteria. He was following the criteria and he knew that because you see, they do understand they both were good on this, right? Right, both of them and they got the highest fans in both, but they did not understand that they had to write at least within 180 to 200 words. I'd say that the safest here is around 250. Don't go beyond that ever, all right? If you want to pass this exam, try not to go beyond it, right? And I'll also tell you, how to do the word count don't worry don't worry dr zisha and i'll tell you how to do the word count as would be learning how to write the letter all right so moving forward the length of the document is appropriate to case and reader no irrelevant information i told you that there are three kinds of informations semi-relevant 
irrelevant and relevant, right? So here it says that no irrelevant information is included. Information is summarized effectively and presented clearly. All right. Now, talking about the clarity right now, we just discussed uh, conciseness. We do not discuss clarity. Now, in your letters, there is one of the letters where it's written. Uh, there is this patient and she has PCOs, right, or PCOD, which is polycystic ovarian disease. The person has PCOD, right? And it's written in their in their um in their monarchical uh, history, right? In their history of uh, menses that the person it's it's written clearly, like same as I'm going to write right now. It says that um the age. All right, so, so this person has PC, PCODs, right? She has polycystic ovarian disease, right? And she has just had a boyfriend, right? And she's living with him. And she was taken an IUD, right? Which is, intra, uh, she, sorry, she was taken COCP, which is combined oral contraceptive pills. She was taken it. And it's written like this, that COCP with new boyfriend, Right, and then it goes on that menarche, or sorry, start menses eighteen of eighteen years. Right. So COCP with BF, right, boyfriend, start menses 18 years. What does this mean? That she has been taking COCP since she has been with her new boyfriend, or she has been taking COCP since the age of 18 years? Or it's been 18 years that she's been taking COCP. What does this mean in regard to COCP? That has she been taking COCP? Uh, this is exactly the same line that I've written from your letters from the. All right, so somebody's uh, Dr. Heather is saying. No, I'm not telling you the age of the patient. All right, I'll tell you the age of the patient, uh, 22 years. All right. OK, I told you the age of the patient. Now tell me, what does this mean? It's literally the same way. It's literally written the same way. There are no commas. There are no full stops. It just goes like this. There is a bit of information. And then there is this line where it says this. How would you write this? What do you think it is? In regard to the COCP. <coughs> yes. It started with new boyfriend when she started a relationship, right? So it's very clear there. But what if I told you that you guys are wrong and she has been taking what this sentence means is that uh, she has been taking COCP since 18 years, right? And uh, that that the COCP was stopped when she went on with the new boyfriend. Could it be like that? It could be right. It could be what I'm saying here is that always First, always read the whole letter because somewhere around in this in such kind of letter, there is written clearly that she had been taken COCB with a new boyfriend. And, and what I'm trying to say here is that do not start writing your letter unless you read the whole thing, right? There was this bit of information there, right? It could mean anything right now because I told you that she's 22 years old and it could mean that she started her menses at the age of that her age of menarche was 18 years. It could mean that she's been taking the COCP for 18 years, or it could mean that she has been taking COCP when she was with new boyfriend, right? Or it could mean that with new boyfriend, she started having, uh, um, uh, that's when her age of menarche started. So it's really, really important. What I'm trying to say here is, and don't ever fall for such things. Try to understand the letter first and then go on to um, writing the letter, right? So what what was in the, in the next bit of this letter? It was written in the next bit of the letter that she started COCP two months ago. That's what That's what was written there. Right. Two months ago, she started COCP. 
okay and her boyfriend was uh, there with her two years ago since two years so make sure that you read the whole letter before you start deciding it right you guys have to because you know why why i told you this because sometimes the letter could be very very confusing and the clarity of the letter is when you understand the letter wholly and that you would understand that when you read the le letter wholly all right so be very very sure that you perfectly present the information provided to you is this point clear Any questions so far? Because we're coming to the last of them. All right. Now, uh, I hope there are no questions. Now, talking about the genre and style, can anybody tell me the difference between genre and style? Or what is genre? What does genre mean? Can you guys hear me? layout okay all right that's what you're saying dr shabana it means that layout you don't know all right so um what are we because oet is occupational english test nurses take it dentists take it uh physiotherapists take it and we are doctors we're taking it right so genre means because you know this is not just for us doctors this is for everyone what it means here is that when you write the letter, you make sure that you're using clinical terminologies that doctors use, right? And you're using the information which is factual, right? Okay, now let's talk about this a bit. There is a case, right, where the person, uh, where, where a couple is trying to conceive, right? And they are in the um, infertility clinic. I hope you guys can hear me because I'm asking you, I'm going to ask a question. So they're in the infertility clinic and you are their GP. You're trying to send this patient to um, a gynecologist, right? You're, you're sending them to an infertility clinic. Now the wife tells you that her husband drinks around three or four, uh, four glasses of wine a day, right? And she just presented to you a day before alone. The next day, the husband comes up to you and he says that he doesn't drink at all. Which, uh, which set of information are you going to include in the letter of the wife or of the husband? Because that's what we. What should be writing those? What do you think is factual? I think true is what is the wife saying, but uh, you should actually, I mean, um, rely on a patient. I mean, uh, you if should you say what the patient says. You don't have to twice ask the patient because the information's been given to you already, right? They do have a ruse in between them, uh, and and they are having some tussles in between them, right? But you have been just given the information on the layout, right? It's been given to you. You are not taking the history at that very time. So what would you write? You're sending this patient to a gynecologist and you're telling them the wife told you that he's been drinking around four or five glasses of wine a day and the husband says that he doesn't drink at all. What do you write? We'll write the wife's statement, right? Write the wife's statement. How would you write it? You would say that, for example, Mrs. Karen says that he drinks three or four times a day, or you would say, Mr. Karen, however, Mr. Karen disagrees, or you would be saying simply that a uh, husband drinks. Well, just according to his wife, he drinks blah, blah. Okay. All right. So we're being feminists here. See, here you have to dig a little deep. It doesn't really matter what you write. You just have to write that probably he drinks right you would say probably he drinks because you know what we're trying to be here is what we're trying to do here is being non-judgmental right i hope you understand what i'm trying to say what i'm trying to say here is that for example uh, now there is another another patient right and they come up to you and they are around 50 pounds right or 150 pounds and we're saying that uh, that she is fat would you be writing in your letter that she's fat or would you be writing their BMI and say that they are overweight? Overweight. Overweight, right? Try to go actual don't ever use word which are judgmental, right? Or or you would be saying that she's a smoker or a girl. Or you'd not be saying that she's very fat or she has put on very fat. As doctors, you're going to use clinical professional terminology. You're going to be very 
factual you're right and you're going to use appropriate terminologies in accordance to your gen genre right so instead of saying that you know uh that the person has sugar right you'd be saying that the person has diabetes mellitus right that is in accordance to us as doctors because we say that the person has diabetes mellitus right so try to be very very specific and you can use clinical terms for example there is a patient and they are um a psychiatric case and they see um they can hear the dead right they can hear the dead and they can see uh, and 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 they they can see people right what is the person having they're having hallucinations right they're having audio visual hallucinations instead of saying that they can see people and they can hear people you're going to say that they're having audio visual hallucinations i know that this is something you think is basic but when you write the letter and when you would be looking at the letters you probably want to write in the same words as as are written on the letter but don't do that go for clinical factual information which is appropriate to your genre as a doctor right now i'm i'm right now i have written a letter right and i'm i'm trying to end it off and i'm saying um inform me and we're sending this letter uh, this letter to a radiologist right and we are gp we're sending a letter to radiologists and we're asking them to go uh, to uh, get a get a ct scan of a patient right and i have written all the letter and at the end i'm saying inform me about his ct scan right this is one sentence the second sentence i'm saying kindly inform me about his cd scan which one do you think is better or both of them are fine kindly kindly inform me kindly right or if i could say please right we're not going to be rude or bossy when we write the letter we have to be very very polite when you write the letter right so discipline is really really important you being polite uh, when you write the letter is very very important you'd be using words like please kindly right things like that it's really really important that you use such words all right so i hope it's clear i told you about the technical language right and we'd be also learning about more technical language in the grammar classes i also told you about the abbreviations the politeness so this is what is your third fourth criteria genre style now coming to organization and layout we've talked about it a little but first let me just are there any questions about the previous ones any questions at all anybody is confused on anything no should we move forward all right now coming to the to the fifth criteria which is organization and layout what does organization mean what is what is the difference between organization and layout anybody at all i hope you guys can hear me paragraph wise order all right okay now as i gave you a lot of information right so there is there there is a certain way that you write a letter right so i'm telling you that we are now again i'm giving you a case i'm telling you that there is a patient and they have had they have had um they have a history of heart failure right again they have heart failure they have a history of asthma just two days ago they came to you with dyspepsia i hope you know what dyspepsia is right that they had heartburn right and in this morning today morning they came with uh, acute ccf which is congestive heart failure right so what this patient has is heart failure they are asthmatic two days ago they had dyspepsia and just this morning they came with acute congestive cardiac failure symptoms of that and we are sending this patient to cardiac emergency to an emergency doctor now my question here again is when you're writing this information what would you write first would you write about their dyspepsia first Def definitely you would write this in the history i'm asking them what would you write first dyspepsia first there are there are symptoms of acute cardiac failure first what would you write first symptoms of acute cardiac failure right you'd be writing that first so this is what they mean when they talk about the organization that write the most important information first right for example i start my letter right i have to write my letter in in uh, I'll, i'll be telling you how to write the letter right so we have our introduction all right then we have our social history paragraph right social history paragraph personal history paragraph then we have their visits here first second maybe the most recent one right i'm going like this right and then you write the conclusion 
All right. So when you write an emergency letter like this one, would you write this social history right after introduction or first you'd write their recent visit first? For example, in their social history, it's written that the person is depressed, right? The person has asthma and he's allergic to penicillin and that, you know, he has um, he has diabetes mellitus and he has hypertension. He has a lot of problems. He has fractures. He has osteoporosis. He has Cushing's disease, right? So he has a lot of things. And we have to write all of this in the social history paragraph, right? And I'm telling you that we're setting this. This is the same case that we're talking about, that this person had heart failure just in the morning and we're writing the letter. So what do you think should be done right now? Should we write the introduction first? We would definitely write the introduction first. But after that, should we write the social history paragraph or should we first write about his, uh, his recent condition first? Recent condition. Right, we'll be writing their recent condition first. This is what the organization means. It means that you have paragraphed the information together, right, appropriately, logically, clearly. Key information is highlighted. The key information here was their status right now. I mean, we are definitely going to write this that he's allergic to penicillin and he is having fractures. He is hypertensive. He has Cushing's disease. But the first thing that you'd be writing about is his condition at the moment. So key information would always come first. Write the most important information first. Is this clear to everybody? Because now we're moving forward. Subsections are well organized. Document is well laid out. Make sure that you use a good pencil, right? Try. I know that a lot of our writings aren't good, but when you'd be writing the letter, make sure that you write things which are um, which are decipherable. Right, which which the reader can decipher. If not, then even if you've written the right thing, they would not give you good marks, right? They wouldn't give you marks at all. For example, I'm writing asthma like this. Right? Do you think they'd understand? They wouldn't. You have to write like this, maybe. Right? So that it's kind of clear to them. Right? Make sure that you have the correct spellings. It's really, really important that you use the correct spellings. Right. And now let's move to the last criteria. So here it says language features. Right, like spelling should be correct, punctuation should be correct, vocabulary should be correct, grammar and sentence structure should be correct. And when you write these, it should not interfere with the meaning. For example, if I'm saying I'm, I'm writing a lot of words, I'm saying, uh, for example, um, I'm, I'm, I'm using terminologies and I'm using a lot of connectors. I'm saying, however, the patient has had uh, has had uh, multiple problems. Therefore, we're giving him this. And unfortunately, so I used four or five connectors together. However, unfortunately, additionally, try not to use many connectors if they interfere in the meaning. Right. So if you guys have any questions about this, uh, these criteria, please do ask. If not, then we'd be moving forward to how to write the letter. Any questions? Yeah, I have a question. What English like is should we use like American English or British English, which is more similar to Australian? Like, for yes. example. OK, yeah, it's C-O-L-O-R or C-O-L-O-U-R, which is OK. It? That okay. is my question. Well, because question I will be giving my exam in the US, but it's an already right. exam. Yeah. What I recommend is don't confuse in those things. Obviously, they would, if you, unless you're writing C, unless you're writing K O L O R, right? And or if yeah. you're writing L O R E, it doesn't matter. Right. Okay. Yeah. These are very these are very minute, minute differences. Okay, okay, right. Okay. Accent, when you take in this exam, your accent doesn't matter. Right. Your uh -huh. pronunciation does matter. Right. But your yeah. spellings, unless they are correct and they have been accepted by the Oxford Dictionary. Right. They don't matter. Mm. All right. You so can write C-O-R. Oh, Oxford. <laughs> British. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Unless you're writing with a K, um, it's accepted. All right. Yeah, that is helpful because this was bothering yeah. me. Like, yeah, thank Don't you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry yeah. about it. Don't worry thank about you, it. You. Okay, should we move forward? Any other questions? Any questions at all? Okay, so yeah. um, in around 15 minutes or 20 minutes, we'll be learning how to write the letter. I recommend that you, I've sent you the drive link, right? From tomorrow onwards, we'll be doing the grammar. Uh, for in the next three days, hopefully would complete the grammar that is required for you to write a correct letter, right? Because it's not the usual grammar and there are certain things that OET wants you to write or wants you to know when you're writing the letter. 
And there are certain sentences that you have to understand or include in your letters. So we'd be doing grammar in the next three days. And after that, in the next four days, we'd be writing letters together. I'll be giving you different kinds of letters. And those letters are almost the basis for any kind of letter that might come your way on exam day, right? Because definitely they can give you any kind of letter, right? They can give you any kind of speaking cards. I'm going to conduct speaking classes as well, but I'm taking them separately. What I'm trying to say right now is that focus on how you write the letter. This is a free session for everybody who's joining in. I'm also going to post it um, on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. You can watch it there as well. What I'm trying to say right now is please focus on it. If you're not going to attend the other classes, it's really, really important that you understand how to write a letter. Letter, right and i have i have uh, written this from oet futureland i have also followed e2 guidelines and i also followed benchmark guidelines right you can write letter in any way but the most important things that you have to learn in here are the introduction how you lay out of uh, the the material the content for your letter writing all right so should we start how do you understand how to understand how to write a letter okay so the first thing is that when you're writing the letter on the top of it, right, there comes your, right, this is where your address comes in, right? So you've been given something, right? You've been given a letter, right? And, and here is your task, right? Here is given all the information. Here you'd be given the task, right? In the task, they'd give you the address, right? They'd give you the address, okay? So what would you do is that you would write the address at the top, left corner of your letter right i'm going to open one letter i'm going to share it with you right now but till then i'm just going to tell you how to write the letter after you've written the address right then you'd be writing re which is regarding right regarding sorry sorry first you'd be writing the date right after that you'd be writing re which is regarding the person which is the name of the patient, right? And here you'd be writing, dear doctor, okay? All right, so here you write the whole address. Here you write the date. Any, any questions? Is anybody trying to ask any questions? All right, I hope my voice is not equal. I hope you can understand it. Right, everybody clear? Everybody can hear me, right? Yes, yes, we can hear. Okay, that's great. So here you write the address. Here you write the date. Now, a date you can write in the, if you're writing date like this, then try to write date throughout like this. If you're writing date like this, right, then try to write the date like this throughout the letter. All right. Try to make sure that you're writing or using the same pattern throughout right then you'd be writing dear doctor you would put a comma in here you would write the name of the patient uh, the name of the doctor then you'd be writing here regarding here you'd be putting the name of the patient and here you'd be putting the age of the patient right after that here you'd be writing the introduction then depending on what kind of situation it is either you'd be writing their first visit their recent visit their most recent visit or you'd be writing here social history right social history would include their personal history everything that the per that the person has or has had in the past, past history, social history, personal history that comes in here, right? After that, you'd be writing the first visit, right? Either their their old their their um their first visit, as in the first time they presented to you, right? The first time they presented to you, that's what you write here. Then here comes your second visit, and at the end you would write the conclusion, and at the end and at the very end you would be writing the request, right? And here you write sincerely, right, comma, and you would be writing doctor. If you know the patient, if you know the doctor, like if, if they gave you the name of the doctor, you'd be writing sincerely. If they did not give you the name of the doctor, then you'd be writing faithfully. It's a pattern kind of clear, right? That's a pattern, right? You write your address in here, right? After address, you write the date, you write dear doctor, you write regarding the patient's detail. Here you write the introduction, here you write the social history, then you write the rest of the paragraphs. Here's your conclusion and here you write the request. Any questions? Okay, if not, then I'm just sharing with you a letter. I have a confusion about the request. So far, I know that request should be in the uh, introduction because there is a, there I have to pinpoint what I'm trying to uh, ask yes, to that's, do. That's what I'm going to talk about right now. Okay. 
All right. I'm, I'm just asking if you have questions in regard to the um, the thing that we're doing going to do right now. No, no. I have a confusion that where I should write the request in the introduction or in the conclusion. What do you think should be done? Or if you write in both, would would that uh, would that be wrong? There's some. There's some is my confusion. So do I write to both or? What do you think should be done? What do you think as a doctor should be done? Okay, so. Um, I'm asking you. What do you think? What do you think should be done? Okay, so should you write it in the introduction. Should you write it at the end, or if you write in both, would that make a difference, or would that be wrong? Uh, yeah. So uh, there, as there is a word limit, so that I, I think myself, I can write in the introduction. So is that correct? Yeah, you can do that. You okay. can do that. If you want to do it? You can do that like that. But I'm not talking about the request. Request. Here I'm talking about this thing. If you have any queries, okay. right, that's fine. If you have any queries, do not hesitate to contact me. That's the one. Okay, thank you. Thank you okay. so much. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, any other questions regarding the, regarding the layout? If not, then let's just move into it. So this is how you write the letter, right? I've shared with you the... Uh, wait a second. Okay, I have shared with you the. Can you guys see sorry. this? Uh, uh, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I have a small question. Yeah, please. Uh, it might be silly. So, no. um, <laughs> so uh, we write the name of the patient and date of birth, right? Like yesterday, I uh, saw the letters in Google Drive link that was shared. Uh, by hmm. you and many other people. So in some letters, the date of birth was written immediately beside the name of the patient mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. below the name of the patient. Mm -hmm. So which one is more appropriate or it doesn't matter? All right, I'll, I'll answer this in a bit. Is that okay with you? Thank you. Okay, no worries about it. Any other questions so far? If not, then let's just talk about it. So see here, this is your writing task. I hope you can see the screen. I hope the cursor is kind of visible. Right here is a writing task. It says, Mrs. Bethany, Miss Bethany Taylor, 35 year old patient in the psychiatric ward where you are working as a doctor. Using the information given in the case notes, write a discharge letter to the patient's primary care physician, Dr. De, uh, Dr. Giovanni De, De Coscio, uh, Proudhurst, Friendly Practice, 23 Brightfield Avenue, Proudhurst, right? So, where is your address? Top left corner. No, no, no. Here, where is your address? Which is your address? Proudhurst. All the address. Right? Physically. Starting from the name of the patient, a name of the doctor, which is Dr. Giovanni, to the Proudhurst. How would you write it? You would write it like this. All right. Okay. Wait a second. Okay, so you'd be writing your address like this. This would be your first line. This would be your first line. This would be your second line. This would be your third line. This would be your fourth line. So Dr. Giovanni, right, Proudhurst, then 231 Brightfield Avenue, Proudhurst. All right, so should you put commas in here or not? No. No? Can I ask should you get them? Ten. Like your font size is too small. We, I cannot read anything or don't understand what is written there. Is it okay, possible? I have, shared, to make it I have shared it on the group as well. I have shared it oh. on the group as well. If you can oh, open it. Okay. okay, thank you. No worries. I'm sorry. I have tried to share it, but I don't know why the font's not working. I'm just going to zoom in. I hope this is better now somehow. Okay, so, so like this, right? This is your name of the doctor right that comes first then wherever the person is working then their street or building and then the area right so i'm asking should you put the commas in there or not like they have put commas in here no no comma there should be no commas right don't put the commas in all right so you just um write the address as it is right as it's been written here so first you write the name of the doctor or if there is no doctor then you write the name of admitting officer Right, or you write admitting officer and you just write uh, directly write that. 
right? That whatever, if, if the name's not given, then admitting officer, emergency medical department or whatever, right? Then you write their speciality if it's been given, then you write the address, then you write today's date, then you write the name of the doctor, right? Then you write the patient's name and the date of birth and age, right? So it's been written right here. This is not very clear, but I hope you guys can see it in the document that's been shared on the group as well. So when you write the introduction, now let's talk about writing the introduction. What would the introduction include? Okay, any questions regarding the um, address bit? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, will we place the comma between the patient's name and date of birth? No, it doesn't matter. No, no. Uh, OK, I know why you ha guys are confused. Now you see, when does your word count of 180 to 200 start? Like from the time you write address to the time you write thank you? No, your word count starts from when you started writing your letter, when you start saying, I write from introduction, right? From your introduction that's where your word count starts from so whatever you write before that don't write songs in here but do write the relevant information don't write songs in here but it doesn't matter right if you use commas or not if you write the date of birth in uh, below the name of the doctor or below the request or below regarding point doesn't matter what matters is what you write here and when you start saying sincerely whatever you say before that between that that's what matters and that's what your letter would be marked on clear any questions now? OK, now let's let's talk about how you write the letter. So what would you write in the introduction? Now, introduction would have um, two sentences approximately. Right, two sentences approximately, which would be around 20 to 30 words. Right, 20 to 30 words. This is your introduction. All right, there there are certain things that you need to write in the introduction. The first thing that you need to write is thank you. Thank you for seeing, right? Or you could say, I am writing to discharge, to transfer, whatever that is. Thank you for seeing the patient's name. I am writing to discharge, to transfer, to whatever is happening there. Then you write, after that, you'd be putting, a, then you'd be putting a full, full stop. Then you write the name of the patient, right? The age of the patient. Right, then you write the profession of the patient. All right, after that, you'd be writing the reason the patient came to you or what the patient has, right, or why you are sending the patient. Right, after that, you'd be writing the reason of referral or reason of writing the letter. All right, everybody following through, then you put a full stop in here. Right. So the reason of referral would have maybe the diagnosis, the person's recent condition, their current condition, why you're sending them. Right. This is your first sentence, which would include thank you for seeing whatever the patient's name or I'm writing to refer, discharge or transfer the patient's name, age, profession, reason of referral. Right. This is your first sentence. The second sentence would include your request. All right, the second sentence would include your request where you'd be saying that your further management, either you say your further management. All right, or you would be talking about um, I would highly appreciate if you could manage the condition of the patient or whatever, right? So these are your two questions or two sentences, apologies, two sentences that you write in your introduction, right? This is your introduction. This is which defines the purpose of your letter, right? This, this line right here, this is where you write the purpose of your letter, right? Very, very important that you understand the purpose of your letter and you include it in your introduction because, you know, when you'd be saying, thank you for seeing this, then you'd be writing who came to me with whatever, 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 that is a purpose, right? That he came to you for this and this, and now you're sending them for a particular reason, right? Okay. Or if you're saying I'm writing, if you're if you're not saying thank you for seeing and you're saying I'm writing to refer, discharge, transfer, that also tells the purpose of the letter that are you referring them? Are you discharging them? Are you transferring them? Right. Then when you've written the reason of referral, after that you write the request, your further management would be highly appreciated or so and so. OK, everything clear about introduction? 
I mean, uh, I just have a question. So yes, please. you have to uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, so I just wanted to thank you first. And then do we have to write thank you for seeing the patient before <laughs> we're writing the request for referral or transfer? Um, so, so what you're saying is that should you write thank you before the uh, the request here? That's what yeah, you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, because we are referring. Uh, mm -hmm. to the doctor to to uh, the patient to be seen right uh, and he's obviously not seeing the patient so we're going to start with the thank you for seeing him like doesn't does it make sense i mean oh you're saying the right thing i mean i told you there are two ways you can say it for example i'm going to say it right now i'm, I'm giving you an introduction uh, please i hope that uh, you can hear me clearly and as i say it you understand so i'm saying thank you for seeing mrs serena a 47 year old actress who is uh, who presented with features suggestive of asthma and requires and it requires medication for asthma full stop your further management and assessment of the patient would be highly appreciated right this is how i wrote mm -hmm. introduction in the first way now i'm saying now this is another way of writing introduction i'm saying i'm writing to refer mrs serena a 47 year old actress whose features are suggestive of asthma and she requires your help in creating a medicine uh, chart uh full stop your further management and assessment of the patient would be highly appreciated i think both of them are fine no okay yeah i so i thought Get it? We, yeah i got it now thank you okay i hope i understood your question because the voice was breaking out okay Okay. All right, yeah, now I let's thought we, we have yeah. to do the both, but I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. You have to do the, the, the one thing only. All right. You have to do yeah. one thing only. Yeah. Okay. All right. After that, we're moving to your second paragraph. Now, usually, if it's not an emergency letter, right? If it's not an emergency letter, just 20 minutes more with me and then you're done. I hope you guys are not freaking out, right? Or annoyed, right? So, after introduction, all right. Depending on what kind of letter it is, whether it's an emergency letter, whether it is a normal, regular letter of referral, right? What you'd be doing is you'd be writing, if it's not an emergency letter, then you'd be writing social history. All right, social history paragraph or, um, or what is known as the personal history paragraph, right? In this paragraph, you'd be including social history, personal history, past history, right? Uh, medicinal history. Right. This is what you'd write in the paragraph. The second paragraph after introduction. Introduction is your first paragraph. Your second paragraph is here. Now, how should you start your second paragraph? How many words should it have? It should have around 40 to 50 words, right? 40 to 50 words. You can make as many sentences if you want. Try not to make short sentences. Kind of make, uh, you know, appropriate medium size, medium length uh, uh, sentences, right? So I suggest that first you start by their marital status, right? You should write the marital status first. Then you should move to their medical history if they have any. And in also in, in medical history, try to write the most recent one first or the one with more uh, most importance in relevance to the case first, right? After marital status, medical history, you would write that. And after that, you might want to write the drugs for whatever the medical history that person has, right? So marital history, medical history, drug history, then you write their family history. If the person has had any such cases or relevant um, information regarding the family that the person that you're sending the letter to should know, then you should write their allergy history. All right, this is what your second paragraph would include, right? Social, personal, past. Also here you'd be writing in the medical history also comes in whether they are taken, whether, uh, sorry, after, after marital status, you'd be writing whether they are smoking drinking etc right this is your personal history so you definitely write the personal history first then you write the medical history the drug history the family history the allergy history is this clear any questions is this clear no questions i hope you yes. guys are listening yeah Okay, great. Now, after you've written the introduction, the past um, history, the medical history, whatever that was, the second paragraph, then comes your your body paragraph, right? Your third body paragraph. Third body paragraph, right? These are body paragraphs after introduction. Uh, this is your second body paragraph after the social history, right? So the first paragraph was introduction. 
right? The second one was your social history paragraph. OK, the third paragraph is body paragraph here. You would be writing their last their their old visit first, right? Their recent most visit, right? Depending on what kind of letter it is, you'd be writing their uh, recent visit first. Now, my question to you is. That you all are doctors, right? Whoever is listening right now, we all are doctors, right? Any nurses? If you are, no problem. If you are, please say if you are. All of you guys are doctors, right? Or even nurses. So when a patient comes to you, what is the first thing that you do? They come to your ward, you are sitting with them, Greetings. you're about to take your history. What do you do first? Greetings. What do you ask them? What? Readings? Directly you go to the readings? Confirm oh, the name. Greetings. That will ask good morning or all something right. like greetings. that. Yeah. All right. After you've done their greetings, what do you do next? You've taken the consent and you've, uh, you've greeted them. What do you do next? We'll ask, how can I help you today? Present complaint. Okay. Presenting complaints, right? You start by their complaints, right? OK, what is the reason they came? What is their history, right? You start by their complaints. So in short, you've taken their history. That's the first thing that you do. After you've taken the history, what do you do next? Examination. Right, that's the second thing that you do. You do examination. All right, now you've taken the, you've done the examination, you've taken the history. What's the next thing you do? <coughs> Investigation. Investigations, right? So the next thing that you do is you write the investigations, you send investigations. After you've investigated them, what do you do next? Medication. Medication. All oh, right. For example, I came to you and you guys are awesome that I came to you. You asked my history. You did my examination. You have my investigations and now you're going to directly give me the medication, right? You oh, wouldn't diagnose me. Like, like you wouldn't diagnose me with anything, right? You wouldn't diagnose me with anything. You would just directly after taking my history examination, doing my lab investigations, you would directly give me medications, right? It depends on the type of the case, if it's acute or what. Yeah, so, or, no, no, no. OK, so uh, what I'm saying here is that after you've done the examination, the history examination investigation, I was being sarcastic. I'm sorry, my sarcasm isn't good. Uh, you would be writing the diagnosis, like what the patient has, right? How would you directly move to medication if you don't know what the patient has? <laughs> right? Clear? OK, so the first thing is history. Yes. After that, you do their examination. Then you talk about taking the investigations. Then you do the diagnosis. You have to write the diagnosis, what the patient had, right? Then you give the medications. After you've given the medications, what's the next thing that you do? Reassure. Reassure. Talk All right. About side effect, allergies, and okay. follow up. That's visit. done. That's done. That's done. With medication. You've written the allergies in the previous paragraphs as well. What do you do next? We'll, we'll follow we'll up. Make the follow up visit. All right. So, what do you do before follow up? Asking if they have any advice. Right? Right? To advise them. Right, you recommend them. Right, you recommend them something. Right, for example, you would advise them regarding their lifestyle change. Maybe you'd recommend them certain ways of doing things. Right, maybe you'd rec recommend them a walk. Right, Th that does not include in your history, in examination, investigation, diagnosis, medication, or follow up. There's a separate, a separate part of it. Right, you would be counseling them. Maybe you counsel them. Right, this is what you write in your body paragraphs. This is the order of you writing the body paragraph. First, you'd be writing whatever the person's complaints were. That would include both the sign and symptoms, right? That includes both the sign and symptoms. After that, you'd be writing their examination, whatever examination you did or whatever the examination results, uh, whatever examination uh, you had done, right? Then you'd be writing investigations, whether the investigations you had ordered on that particular visit or so whatever the results came from their last visit. 
After that, you'd be writing the diagnosis based on these above things. Then you'd be writing about the medication the patient was prescribed with or if you changed any medication. After that, you'd be writing their advice, whatever you advise them regarding, if you recommended them something, if you counsel them regarding something, and you would end up with a follow-up if you are following them up or if you had planned any reviews, review visits. Is this clear? That's how you write your body paragraph. Is this clear? Any questions? Mm. Makes uh, sense. Th yeah. Thank you. I have a question. So, um, thank you. Okay. So, uh, just just in um, curiosity, if they don't provide any diagnosis, mm -hmm. uh, so do I need to do diagnose myself, or I no. will follow them? Because they, if they don't, never, in the case never. not. In the case not, if they don't say any diagnosis, so mm -hmm. what should I do? Right. May I know your name? I'm sorry. May I know your name? Oh, FQ. I'm OK. Yes. All right. All right, Dr. SQ. What I'm saying here is that don't ever put in anything from yourself, right? Don't make assumptions. Don't write anything that is not given in the case notes. That's a very good question. I forgot to tell you, right? It's a very, very good question that should you write something that's not given to you or should you assume the diagnosis from yourself? Never, ever do that. It's not written on that particular visit. You did not diagnose them with anything. Don't do that, right? Thank you. Unless it's written that a probable diagnosis was made, right? OK, I asked about the diagnosis here because, you know, unless the case has not been diagnosed in, in normal visits, then you would be not writing about the medication depending on what the diagnosis was. Right. If you don't if you are not given the diagnosis, don't write that in that particular visit. Never, ever write anything from your side. Never add anything from your side. Never remove anything that was relevant from your side. Write whatever is given in the uh, in the case notes. All right. Clear. OK, Any so questions. Okay, so in yes, that please. case, we just only, um, uh, I mean, elaborate the um, symptoms the patient have, yeah? No, no, it depends on what your letter has, what okay. case notes have been provided to you, right? Right now, I just told you how you organize the thing. What would you write, right? I hope this this writing makes sense because it's a very bad one, right? Um, every, everything clear? Any questions so far? No? All right, so after you've written the body paragraphs, right, I told you that you'd be writing the complaints, signs and symptoms of the on the initial visit, right? On their initial visits, what were their signs and symptoms? What was their examination finding? What treatment, uh, what uh, were the investigations that you sent for? What was the diagnosis? On what diagnosis you treated them? How uh, did you advise them regarding something? Did you put a follow up? on the initial visit, right? When you write the second paragraph, you'd be writing there's on, on, so you'd be saying on this date, right? You'd be saying on whatever the date was, right? Here, first paragraph, you'd be saying initially, right? The first time. Second, you'd be saying uh, subsequently. On the second paragraph, you'd be saying subsequently. Then on today's visit, like the last visit, then you'd be saying today's visit. Right. That's how you begin your paragraphs, your body paragraphs, initial visit, initial examination, initial treatment, initial questioning. Right. Second paragraph or th a second visit, third visit or new visit, you'd be saying subsequently. Right. Then you'd be saying on the last visit, today's visit. Right. Or final condition. Right. Or finally. Right. These are the words that you'd be using firstly, secondly, subsequently, initially, uh, conclusively. Right or on today's visit, on this date, initially. I hope you guys are following me. I hope I haven't mixed anything up. Right? Okay. I mean, shouldn't it be the other way around that we, we should start with the today, today's visit and then go on with and, Depends and try to. Depends on the case note. Depends mm -hmm. on the case note. Okay. All right? Depends on the case notes. That's what we'd be learning in the future classes, inshallah, hopefully. All right? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay? So that's what we'll be doing. I hope you guys are clear with how you write the introduction, the social history paragraphs, the body paragraphs, right? Now we're moving to conclusion, okay? I'm about to end the session, bear with me, okay? All right, so after you've written the introduction, the social history paragraph, right? Then you've written all the body paragraphs, right? Of their conditions. Now you're moving to conclusion. In conclusion, you'd be writing the following things. 
the diagnosis. What is what are you referring them for? The request. Somebody asked that should we write the request again? I recommend that you should write it again. It doesn't matter. It wouldn't take much of your word count, right? It wouldn't take much of your word count. If you want to write it, you can write it. If you don't want to write it, you should not write it. But I think that when you're writing a conclusion, you can repeat the thing. I know benchmark says no, but then again, when uh, many of the students who are with me and when I was there, I used to write the same letter and sometimes we same the, uh, send the same letter to them and Sometimes they'd give me or give them a great C, right? And for the same letter with the same punctuation, they would give another person or the same person grade B. So they have very fluctuating uh, kind of opinions. And many a times they do that. So whenever you have any query, this is a tip. Whenever you have any query, directly text OET on Facebook page, right? Or text them or email them. Right, that's one thing. And uh, also, as somebody had asked, should we write it in the introduction, the request, or should we write it in the conclusion? I say write in both. That's all right. Right, that if you if you don't want to write it in the introduction, write it at the very end. But do write it. It's not like you should exclude the request part. Right. So in the conclusion, you'd be writing the diagnosis, whatever the final diagnosis was, or what was the final status of the patient. Right. Then you'd be writing about the request, whatever request you want. What do you want the person that you're sending this person, this letter to this patient to should do to the patient? Right. And at the end, you'd be writing query part. Right. If the if the doctor that you're signing this letter to has any questions, they should contact with you. All right. OK, so let me just phrase it for you. You'd be saying um, when you write the diagnosis, right, the diagnosis bit right over here. Right, so you'd be saying in view of the above, in view of above, in view of the above, right? In view of the above, or I believe, right? All right, or you would be saying my provisional diagnosis, right? My provisional diagnosis, or you would be saying I would be grateful. This is how you start your conclusion. I would be grateful. If you could, uh, I would be grateful if you could do this, this, this. That's your request. That's how you write it. Or you'd be saying in view of the above. But you know, I say don't write a lot of words because you know how many words are there? One, two, three, four, five, five words. If you start by I believe, that's easier. If you say, I would be grateful, three words, my provisional diagnosis, three words. This is very obsolete. A lot of people recommend that, but I don't. Right? This is this would just aid to the pain that you would have of having many words in your letter. Right? So I say that instead of saying in view of the above and starting your conclusion by in view of the above or by using many words, I say that either uh, go to either of um, choose from among these, right? Choose from these. Choose among these. I believe that let's just think about patient, right? I believe that Mrs. Uh, Wontrop is suffering from uh, myocardial infarction. That was my diagnosis bit. Now I'm writing my request, right? Now I'm writing my request or referral, right? So I'm saying that I believe that Mrs. Wontrop is suffering from myocardial infarction. That's my diagnosis. Or I or, or my provisional diagnosis is that Mrs. Wontrop is some suffering from myocardial infarction. Or I'll I'm saying I would be grateful if you could if you could check Mrs. or if you could assess um, Mrs. Wontrop who's suffering from myocardial infarction. Here I put the request already, right? But if I can if I continue from here after after talking about the diagnosis, I'm saying I believe that the Mrs. Wontrop is suffering from myocardial infarction. Your further, right? Your further uh, management, management, assessment, or whatever was asked for you to do uh, would be highly appreciated. Appreciated, right? Like that. That's your request, right? Or you would say that Mrs. Wontrop is suffering from myocardial infarction. Please uh, manage her further as you deem appropriate, as you deem necessary. That's your request. After writing the diagnosis, you wrote the request. All right. Now the third bit is where you write the query, right? That's how you end your letter in the conclusion query. So in the query, uh, sorry, in the query, you'd be saying, should there be any queries, right? You directly say, should please, should you, should there be, should there be any queries, 
please do not hesitate to contact me to contact me right that's your one part of how you write the query the second way you can write the query is please do not hesitate to contact me if you have any requests or any questions right there are many ways you can say this all right uh, so this is how you write your conclusion right um, if you guys have any questions please do ask and how do you end it you would then just say sincerely if you know the doctor, right? By knowing the doctor, I mean the name of the doctor has been provided on the task. Then you'd be writing sincerely. If you do not know the doctor or it's written, just write a letter to admitting officer. They don't give you the name. Then you write faithfully. So you're faithful to strangers and you're sincere to the people you know. Right? OK, I hope that makes sense. That was a silly one. OK, so sincerely, faithfully, if you do not know the name of the doctor that you're sending this patient to, sincerely, if you know the name of the patient, then you write the commas and then you write simply doctor. Do not write your names. All right. And doctor should be like this. D-O-C-T-O-R small. All of this small. This is capital. Any questions? So you were saying after this writing doctor, I should not write my name? No. Okay. Just to write this doctor. Necessary. I mean, I'm saying that it's not necessary. What you do after you've written sincerely they don't care what you've written after that. They don't care what you've written in the intro in the address. Last point, um, what I said was that if you know the doctor, write yours sincerely. If you don't know the doctor, write yours faithfully. And then you write your, uh, if, you, if they have told you that you are a, uh, a surgical resident, then you write doctor, surgical resident, right? If they have not told you and they've just simply said that you're you are their general physician, then just write doctor. But it doesn't really matter if you write this or not. If they've specified it, then you should write it. But if you if you forget to specify it, they wouldn't they wouldn't judge you on them, right? They wouldn't judge you on that. They would only judge you on what you've written in the paragraphs, right? What you've written in the introduction, in your social history, in your body, in your conclusion. And uh, obviously they'd be looking at your address as well. So try to be nice on that. Don't go on writing songs or don't go on doing blunders in here. Try to make sure that it's a very clear, clearly laid out, very, very uh, visibly attractive kind of letter. Yes, beauty matters in OET as well. So whatever you say, write it beautifully, write uh, clearly. That's really, really important, right? Um, and if you guys have any questions, do ask because I'm about to end this one. Yeah, uh, I have a question like uh, in, in discharge letter, for example, you know, the example that you showed us, uh, I think Proudhurst one. So it, it was a discharge letter and uh, in the letter it was written that you must follow up or you are required to follow up. You know, that's what it is written. So my question is, is it OK to write like that or does it sound very commanding? One thing is it's very clear. Uh, okay, I have shared my screen. If you can read it out for me, whatever yeah, it line is, you think. it is in the mm -hmm. sample letter. This is the case note. It is in the sample letter. Ever, okay, one thing I recommend is that don't this. This has been taken from fifty task file, right? That's what you're talking about, right? Uh, try yeah. not to follow the sample letters of fifty task file. Go for the grade A letters or the samples that have been provided on the OET official website. Go okay. for the sample letters provided in benchmark, right? Go through them. The 50 task file is really, really old, right? I don't okay. recommend that you read the samples from there. I mean, it's important that you understand the language and see how they have written it, but don't follow that. Follow the grammar yes, okay. criteria, grammar okay. file provided by OET, or yes. as would be something in the future, how you write the letter, what you should write in the letter. I mean, this was, this was just the beginning, okay? This was just okay. the beginning, okay? OK, yeah. so uh, in any case, is it OK to write? You must follow up or you are required don't, to follow please, up. Please don't be impolite. Don't be impolite. Whether yeah, it's your yeah. speaking, writing. OK, okay my question, I need to. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 OK, OK, that's my, yeah, well, my question. Okay. Thank, okay. You. Okay. Thank any you. OK, any questions? Any questions other than this? Uh, yes, I have a question. Uh, if the date of birth of the patient is not given, uh, and the only age is given. So, will we write the age in the introduction paragraph or on the live uh, on the line above, like after regarding? I told you that you know whatever you write before introduction, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, you are supposed to write it nicely, but what I recommend is 
that you write the date, uh, the age, and the date of birth before uh, with, uh, right in the line of your introduction. Right? I, I say that you know when you write in the introduction. Right. When you write in the introduction, you would say, thank you for seeing this patient. Then you write the age, the name, the occupation of the patient. Right. So the age should come in there. Right. It doesn't take much of the words. All right. That's what I recommend. It's not necessary. If you want to write in the beginning, you can do that. If you want to write in the introduction, you can do that. It's not that difficult. All right. Trust me. OK. Any other questions? Okay. Any other questions? No. Should I end it? It's been around one or 30 minutes. Okay, so anyone who wants to join, and I don't have slots right now, but we'd be doing uh, definitely after this one, after 10 days, we'd be doing another session of such sort, and we'd be doing another a whole grammar class and whole um, letter discussion classes, and uh, you can join in the next one. Right now, these slots have been closed, but okay, so I'll see you then. Thank you so much. Have a great time.